From Washington, the McLaughlin Group, the American original. For over three decades, the sharpest minds, best sources, hardest talk. Issue one, hacking the election. Okay, get this. The Russian government has hacked into the database of the Democratic National Committee and seized emails and opposition research on Republican presumptive presidential nominee Donald Trump. Why is the Russian government so interested in Mr. Trump and in Democratic Party preparations against him? And here's another cyberspace factoid. Julian Assange, leader of the WikiLeaks organization that has leaked tens of thousands of classified documents in the name of public interest, he says he'll release emails from Hillary Clinton. How did Mr. Assange gain access to the emails? He's not saying. But what the Australian is saying is that the material in those emails is enough to indict the presumptive Democratic presidential nominee, a clear reference to the ongoing FBI criminal investigation of Hillary Clinton's handling of emails during her tenure as Secretary of State. Question, why is Russia disrupting the presidential election? Pat Buchanan. Well, Russia is hacking into the computers of the Democratic National Committee, John, probably for the same reason we broke in to the Democratic National Committee in 1972 <laughs> in the Watergate affair to advance the people's we, right Pat? to know. <laughs> This is, this is a new story. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's what we, that was I know. Right. But the point of the Russians is, look, um, hacking is going on more and more. They'd love to get the negative stuff on Donald in case he's a potential, I mean, he is a potential president of the United States. Assange must have it in for Hillary. And I would take the threat mildly seriously because this Assange character, I'm, I've got no use for him, but he certainly has put material out there deeply damaging. But it shows you the world of modern politics but to be honest, I don't think there's any oppo research on the Donald that is not out there. And also on Hillary, if you want oppo research on her, go to Amazon.com. There are probably 20 books that go into her personal, yeah. private life and everything Bill's ever done. Yeah. Well, I think uh, the Russians are looking at Trump. They don't know that much about his policy positions. I'm not sure he knows that much about his policy positions. And so they're hoping to uncover something that the Democrats have on him. You know, I, I think the fact that they can get into these computers is concerning. I think they're way ahead of U.S. capabilities when it comes to hacking and, and advances in cyberspace, and they're much more aggressive. But you know, I, I, I don't see that this hacking of the DNC uh, computers has any legs as a story. And let's wait to see what Mr. Assange has. He's given new hope to all the people who hope Hillary's going to be indicted. I think not. <laughs> I think it's more hot air. Hot cyber air. <laughs> yeah, well, look, I, I think the Russians, I, I would disagree. that I, th I think NSA, we actually have the most uh, effective capabilities, but we don't use them. And, we, and one of the big problems I think we have is that we haven't, the president hasn't articulated a credible, credible deterrence doctrine in terms of saying to the Chinese and the Russians, to a lesser degree, the French and the Israelis, there are lines you should not cross. And if you do, we're going to shut your networks down. The issue here, though, I think is very interesting. Where did Assange get this from? I think he probably got it from the GRU, the Russian equivalent of the NSA and, and another agency that's under Putin. Um, and I think there are two reasons why. Number one, as Eleanor and you know, Pat suggest, that they want to have an awareness of what is going on behind Donald Trump's, you know, is there something the Democrats are saving for an October surprise uh, or is everything out there? And secondly, I think the Russians actually, because of especially what uh, Trump has said about Putin and about NATO, uh, would preference having, uh, having Trump in there. And I think that's the reason you've probably seen Russian intelligence giving emails from Hillary's server uh, to Assange uh, to potentially then put pressure on her. And that's the only way I could see that happen. <laughs> well, yeah. you solved two mysteries there. Now. I know. Yeah. <laughs> with, with no the evidence. Well, well, let's see. But how else would they get them? How else would they get them? I agree, though, Though, as far as, as uh, Trump is concerned, first of all, uh, they want to find out about Trump for the same reason the rest of us do. What the heck makes this guy tick? Why is he running for president anyway? Uh, and, and is he really running, or is he uh, trying to sabotage himself right now? So that's about the way his campaign has been looking in recent days. Uh, but uh, uh, as far as Assange goes, uh, 
Uh, I, I think, uh, well, I mean, it sounds a lot like uh, the other rumors we've been hearing floating around town that there's evidence that some some uh, uh, some uh, 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 classified information may have gotten out, mm -hmm. but proving that Hillary intended for it to get out. That's mm -hmm. the thing, because right. with Assange but and you know. uh, Assange and and uh, the other uh, uh, guy over there, Snowden, uh, mm -hmm. this is. Uh, obviously, but they I, intended I to release is, that I think information. Tom is right in this sense. I mean, it's about five years ago or more that the U.S. and the Israelis almost blew up that Natanz reactor. Mm. They got into that thing and the computers and mm -hmm. working in all, you Spin know. Spinning the centrifuges mm -hmm. <laughs> a thousand <laughs> times in normal speed. And yeah. blowing up the centrifuges. So I think the Americans have an extraordinary capability. And frankly, you don't want a war. But the idea of, right. of using this, right. say, hold on, fellas. Right. You know, we can do a lot worse to you than you're yeah. doing to us. I mean, yeah. this but is so Mickey far, Mouse at the DNC. But so mm -hmm. far what they've done does not cross any red lines. They're smart enough, the Russians and the Chinese are smart enough to keep it low level so that the there's OPM not hack? a, there, mm -hmm. well, there's not a significant military mm -hmm. or economic response got yet on the part of the administration. 23 million personnel files right. isn't a serious right. hack. Yeah, it what? is if you're working for the government, they got all this background material on you. Yeah? I mean, there's a real the, the, possibility the, of blackmail here. There, there are right. constant <laughs> hacks going on 24-7. Um, most of them don't get through, uh, but it, 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 constant vigilance is what we've got to have, though, this sort of thing. Is Russia preparing a cyber blitz against Hillary Clinton? Uh, I think mm -hmm. the Russians would like to see Hillary Clinton defeated, to be honest. I think as of now, I agree okay. with those who suggest that uh, the Trump would, they'd rather see Trump there because Trump would be more reasonable in, in negotiating the Baltic and the Black Sea problem. Yeah. Right, how would we define a cyber blitz against Hillary Clinton? I don't, I don't know what that would be. Mm -hmm. She's uh, had enough blitzes against her over the last 30 years. What's one more? And, and, it, <laughs> and since when did Trump become reliable as far as any policy issue is concerned? The guy changes his mind sometimes in the same day a, a couple and, of and times around. In, in defense of uh, the, the president, one of the advantages that he has in terms of saying why we shouldn't, I, I mean, I disagree with, I think you need to show deterrence on the cyber front. But every time you use your capability, the enemy learns from it. So oh, yeah. it becomes less useful. So he is, to some degree, they're trying too. to save it up for a cyber war. And we, we, we learn too, of course. What's the best way to punish this Russian cyber intrusion? I think the best way to do it would be to give the Russians a warning, say, we know what you're up to, and we got far greater capability than you do. And if something happens, it's really going to be bad, and then maybe give them a show them it doesn't a little rise bit of to what we got. It doesn't rise to the level of a significant response. In fact, Donald Trump is suggesting that the, the Democrats engineered it <laughs> because they just want to draw attention to it. So I turn, don't think it, people are not taking it that seriously. We could turn the lights on and off in the Kremlin, or we could shut down <laughs> the computer networks in the GRU headquarters. I don't it's think an, we want to do that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we, we have cap capabilities of a yeah. lot of mischief, and they, yeah. they know that. So it's a, but, but, but you know, the fact, fact is, everybody does it. <laughs> this is the slogan yeah. in, the, in the cyber community. And so you have to decide which, which intrusions mm -hmm. you're going to recognize, which ones you're going to take action, which ones are you going to, just going to leave alone. Brave new world. Right. Is Russia preparing a cyber blitz against Hillary Clinton? Yes or no? Uh, I think if Russia's got uh, the oppo, any oppo research on Hillary, they'll dump it. No, they're going to leave that up to her critics in the U.S. <laughs> I, I, I think if they have something, they will use it. Yeah, the Russians will, will uh, poke around any chance they've got, they whether in, uh, even if it's only a yeah. fishing expedition. Yeah. What would that something be? I mean, well, something of her views on NATO? Uh, well, <laughs> political you, corruption, well, whatever right. it is. Why did you guys break into the DNC in, in the Watergate? Uh, in pursuit of the known right. unknowns. Wrong place. Yeah, wrong place. That's right. <laughs> Sometimes people do it just because they can. Wrong place, too many fingerprints. <laughs> Issue two, wealth, women, and men. In a new report this week, the Wall Street this Journal week, took focused, note um, that women speed. in high-skilled jobs continue to earn substantially less than their male counterparts. Male doctors working full-time earned about 210 thousand dollars on average for each of the five years through 2014. Female physicians made 64 percent of that, about $135,000 a year. According to the study, a key cause for lower female wages 
is that women separate themselves from the workforce in order to start and raise families. This allows men to gain years of experience and associated France. earning potential. And note something else. France is also waging its own struggle with perceived sexism. 17 French female politicians published an open letter this week protesting against what they say is endemic sexism from male political colleagues. And note one more factoid. Speaking to New York Magazine, Hillary Clinton claimed she often meets voters who say, quote, I really like you. I just don't know if I can vote for a woman to be president, unquote. Question, is the economy sexist? Try that out on. Uh, I think you can, you know, pick examples here and there. For example, among physicians, uh, females tend to go into family practice, uh, and the men seem to go into the higher paying specialties. Now, is that because women allegedly more caring and nurturing? You know, I don't know. I mean, I think there are some gender differences, but I think they sure are lessening. And we are on our way to full equality, to where men are going to be equal partners in child raising. And we're not quite there yet. Yes, Pat, that's coming. <laughs> He's looking at me with this look of horror on his face. <laughs> uh, but with Hillary Clinton, just to say uh, one thing, uh, Donald Trump went after her early in the campaign, saying if she were a man, she would have no business running for president, that she's not uh, qualified, that she's only running, she's playing the woman card. Uh, and uh, she responded to that and said, if uh, he's accusing me of playing the woman card, deal me in. A lot of women are getting dealt in in this election, and I think this will be uh, somewhat a battle of the sexes. Well, there, there's no doubt that Hillary Clinton does better among women because she is a woman, just like Barack Obama set all-time records among African Americans because he was an African American, the first one, and folks had took great pride in his accomplishments. Now, on women's and the doctors thing, but there are some many outstanding women physicians and things. But John, if you take procedures that are paid for by the state or the federal government, they're not discriminating against those. And and they and government often you know pays the bills here. But I think Eleanor is basically right on that. And I know a lot of women doctors who've raised two, have two and three kids, and they took out months and years, and that's why the other, the guys that stay with it constantly don't take time out, that's why they make more. Well, but there's all kinds of laws on the books that, you know, equal pay for equal work in, in the same work in various professions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One of the things I think that uh, we have to look at it in terms of conservatives is the idea of how do you make social conservatism relevant in the modern age. And one of the areas that, you know, speaking to my father about this and, you know, grudgingly, I think he persuaded me is that actually we should pursue at a state level greater uh, paid maternity leave and paternity leave because we need, to, if, if you think about, and I've, that is a problem in terms of corporate, I've mentioned before, I do worry about things like the minimum wage, but I think the social gain is so significant here in terms of promoting people ha starting families, uh, having children, uh, but also having women being able to take that time out, make that decision and return to the workforce in a position that gives mm -hmm. them the financial confidence, but also that ability to continue generating a productivity gain mm -hmm. in terms of the economy, if we're capitalists, mm -hmm. believing that skill, development, experience leads to an economic gain. And so, you know. But if you believe uh, in free markets, the tendency here is, look, there's inequality. The free market is producing inequality. Yeah. Therefore, government must come in and cancel out the free market and set the reward levels for private enterprise and all the rest of it. And that's not freedom, and that's, that's not a free social that's gain. Old, though. That's old school socialism. <laughs> now we're into the uh, uh, Elizabeth Warren uh, era now, in which you mm -hmm. have incentives uh, that uh, uh, help to do uh, that sort of thing without uh, disrupting the capitalist system. Uh, but I think we're going to see some positive changes here coming up. Mm -hmm. Well, right out of college, there is no difference in pay differential. What makes the difference? A lot of it is uh, whether you take maternity leave, uh, uh, but also your desire to negotiate, uh, for one thing. I mean, uh, yeah. uh, I think testosterone yeah. gives a lot of people a real desire to go yeah. in and push what for higher I never negotiations. asked you for a raise, John. <laughs> <laughs> Dream on. <laughs> or or women, a women, women go into service. Right into the service industry, so to speak, rather than industrial and all the rest of it. You know, they say, well, women, 
executive, they only got so many executives. Ask yourself, how many of the Fortune 500 companies was begun by a woman? Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of small businesses. Uh, in fact, I think now that women dominate in the creation of small business. And right. Pat, maybe long after you and I are forgotten, <laughs> those small businesses would be 500. Fortune 500. Fortune then 500 the men companies. will be running them. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, the women will be running them. <laughs> Issue three: Baltic deployments. We will agree on the deployment by rotation of four robust multinational battalions to Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland. NATO Secretary General Stoltenberg declared that four NATO battalions, totaling 4,000 military personnel, will be deployed to Eastern Europe. One battalion each will be sent to Poland, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. Added to that, two U.S. carrier groups conducted operations in the Mediterranean Sea, while the USS Porter trained with Romanian naval forces in the Black Sea. These actions precede July's annual NATO summit in Warsaw, Poland. NATO is responding to Russian military buildups along the alliance's eastern border. The Rand Corporation warns that these Russian forces could now overrun NATO forces in the Baltic within 60 hours of a conflict commencing. According to Professor Stephen Cohen, quote, there has never been such an amassing of hostile military force on Russia's western frontiers since June 1941, unquote. Question, assess this deployment. Pat Buchanan. John, uh, we're putting in four battalions, but the French and the Italians will not be one of them. We're going to have to find out the Canadians may be the fourth. It's the Germans, the Brits, and the Americans, as usual. This is a force that could not stop any kind of Russian sweep if they went into the Baltics, Baltic states at all 4,000 troops. The Russians are building up in, in that part of uh, the end of the Baltic Sea. You know, I was against the bringing the three Baltic states into NATO, as was George Kennan, for the simple reason, though, that we gloried in their freedom. We simply could not th accept a nuclear war with Russia over whether or not they remained independent. So I think if the next president of the United States, I'd like to see him sit down with Putin and de-escalate on both sides of these borders because neither of us has any interest in any kind of war which might escalate, and the Russians say it will, if they get into a war, escalate to tactical nuclear weapons. You said you'd like to see the next president, and you use the pronoun him. Uh, <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't necessarily know what Putin <laughs> is going to do if he gets into office, but I, I, I do think that we have a, a commitment to the Baltic republics, and that the Russians have been making all these incursions sort of threatening those republics, and I think this is kind of a pushback. I think Russia is still smart enough. They're not going to test the NATO treaty, and I think the NATO treaty is 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 responsible and something that this country will live I up to. I think we should go to war with Russia well, look, if uh, they move into uh, Estonia. They're not going to move yeah. into Estonia. This, this, is, this, is, this is peace through strength. This is the, this Bob Gates, former defense secretary, who's a you know, fantastic thinker, has mentioned the point that in the 2004 accession that Pat is talking about with the Baltic states, that was a political decision made without sufficient military conception. And I think that's right. And I think probably in the balance of history, in the utopian world, on paper, it would be a mistake. But we are where we are. They are members of NATO. You have to have credibility to deter the Russians. The four battalions attended, it's not enough. Absolutely, Pat is right. But it's a tripwire. It's designed cool. to send that message to the Russians. Sadly, I don't think Putin sees credibility from President Obama. I think he would cross the line potentially. So you have to do this. But the final point is with those Lithuania, Estonia, Latvia, they still don't spend 2% on GB GDP. You see the Bulga Bulgarians refusing to go into the Black Sea with us and the Germans, uh, the French refusing to commit. If these NATO nations do not do it, then we simply, they get chucked out.
Well, just, yeah, just very briefly, I don't know that Putin isn't just saber rattling here because right. he loves to do that. Everything he does is motivated by how he's perceived by the Russian people. He doesn't care um, as much about what we think. And, and already he's getting stretched thin with Syria and uh, Ukraine, uh, other involvements they've got. I don't think he wants to go out and invade these countries, uh, 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 these neighboring uh, Eastern Bloc countries, but uh, he wants to show that he's a man of strength. And that I he's agree, got. I a, agree got with you. I don't think he wants to invade either. Mm -hmm. I think, quite frankly, what he wants to be seen as a major superpower, right. equal of the United States, but right. I think he wants to be brought into the West. Pride. And all everybody talking about him is a thug and all these things. They're doing nothing to help us. But look, when you mentioned, you mean if it's a tripwire. What happens if you step over the tripwire and set it off? Are you saying we should fight World War III with Russia, which we avoided? For the so entire would you Cold chuck War, out the Baltic states, I say triple would you that wire when you come I would, to it. I, if necessary, I would tell the Baltic states we are not going to go to war with yeah. Russia over your independence. Period. <laughs> well, well that, 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 that's why I, that, that's not going to fly for the next president. Well, it and it, 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 he it's, would go to it's, war. It's too, we have a commitment there. He We're not going to bail out on that. Nobody's going to war. We're preventing war. Well, NATO's moves deter further Russian military aggression in Ukraine. Yes or no? I don't think the Russians are guilty. I mean, people yeah. aren't going to like this. I don't think they're guilty of Ukraine. We dumped over that government, and he went in and secured his naval base. It rebuffs uh, Russian aggression. Yeah, but Putin's won in Ukraine. I think it rebuffs Russian aggression. Issue four, utopian dreams and trash cans. We will move forward because Venezuelans are tired of this humiliation. We will keep going. Once celebrated as a socialist utopia by liberal celebrities such as Oliver Stone and Sean Penn. In June 2016, Venezuela is near total collapse. From medical devices to sugar supplies, from coffee to vegetables, Venezuelans are suffering a catastrophic shortage of key goods. Although Venezuela has the world's largest oil reserves, it has been pummeled by the collapse in global oil prices. And that's not all. Venezuela's crime rate is now at warlike levels, with murder rates skyrocketing. As a result, Venezuela's President Nicolas Maduro's government is facing growing numbers of street protesters who want the opposition-dominated parliament to force Maduro from power. But President Maduro has other plans. He says that the nation's economic difficulties are the result of a U.S.-led plot involving big business owners, and that he won't back down. What is the status of a recall referendum against President Maduro? Can you handle that all? I think it's basically stalled. Uh, it's in the works, but it hasn't happened. There are no good guys here, if, and the villain really is the economy because the oil prices have tanked and there's no money. And uh, what we're seeing is actually middle-class voters who have been hurt the most, really, because they've kind of lost their entree to the government. And Maduro is a, is a socialist and uh, has t taken care of, of the poor. So he still has a base among the poor people. And what you see is middle-class folks taking uh, to the streets, and you have these competing uh, demonstrations. It's hard to tell how this is going to come out. Maduro has managed to hang on. Uh, the opposition isn't very popular either. But look, uh, there are villains here, and it's Chavez and it is Maduro who have taken this country down the road to hardcore socialism. And you're right, the drop in the price of oil is damaged thing, but they have ruined one of the richest countries in the Western Hemisphere. The Americans, I think, have handled it well. Maduro's been saying the Americans are going to send in the Marines, gunboat diplomacy. And the Americans are staying out and letting it go down. Now, Maduro's got to be dumped or recalled before January 10th, because if it's after that, I believe his vice president would be moved in, and it would be no resolution for a couple of years. So the hope is that this can get done this yep. year and get these guys out of there yep. and let this country go back, uh, frankly, go back to the middle class. In, in the beginning, it wasn't, a, it wasn't, there's no success of socialism here. It's the purest evidence of what happens when socialism leads to its inexorable end, in the sense you had the largest oil reserves in the world, and he paid funds to the poorest members of society, at actually functionally as any you know, capitalist leader could have developed a more you know, beneficial program so to bring public services to the impoverished favelas. But 
in the same time he's destroyed the middle class, they have coffee shortages in Venezuela. They have toilet paper shortages. The hospitals have run out of toilet paper. The people are on the streets. The military is still with Maduro, who's crazy, not as crazy as Chavez. And again, this is, if you look at the economic policies that they pursued, there was the continuing decline in productivity. They ruined foreign investment. And now they have this whirlwind of horror. Well, yeah. that's true as far as that, that goes. But uh, you're leaving out one element, bad management. I yeah. mean, the fact the, is, the, you, you no. can manage a socialist economy and do it well. Where? And everybody Where is that happening? We wouldn't even ha we wouldn't be talking about Venezuela now if, the, if oil prices hadn't tanked. But they didn't save for a rainy day, and you can't just 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 hand out money to poor folks without preparing for the day when you won't have that money to hand out. And that's where Venezuela is stuck right. now. And if the capitalists were in charge of the economy during this period. I don't know that it would have been much better. Yeah. They, well, they're, well, the economy they, is going through it could a wrenching not be change. Worse than it is now. <laughs> well, well, there's no way it can well, be worse. Well, the well, fact is, they, they, the, the, they, they gave it away. Totally some, some, of, some of it got stolen away. He's I mean, given it, to it was just bad management. See, this guy, so, with yeah, due yeah, respect, political. Maduro, I've got nothing against him. The guy's a bus driver. Yep. Well, you, well they, you do have some <laughs> social psychology. He's, he's a bus driver without the charisma of his but predecessor, I, and he wasn't able to his, uh, ride his way through this. And I, you know, I agree. Uh, there's been I, a lot of mismanagement. I think Chavez but is you have lucky to look he's at dead it because think, it would be going yeah, down under him. You have to look mm -hmm. at it and 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 understand the fact that that poor people are still the base of the government that's in power. So this is, it's a power and struggle. And now they don't have toilet paper. But what is, yeah. where, so, where is the socialism that has exactly. worked? Where's Anywhere Cuba? in the world. And Cuba Cuba no, it had, it, for Scandinavia. a time it did, it, the homogenous, the benefits of American capitalism, developing iPhones, they don't develop anything. And the homogenous society was the precursor to that mm -hmm. and define, and now yeah. that they have the, yeah. you know, well, they how have. About a, how I, about, I don't know. How about a mixed economy? Yeah. Is, I mean, this is what we're really talking about here. You know, pure socialism, you're right. It doesn't work, but a mixed economy properly management uh, managed does well. Uh, Venezuela d just didn't have it. Well, that's yeah, why the debate. I yeah. would yeah. accept that. Sort of like <laughs> Cuba. False prediction. Will China accept the Hague's verdict on the legality of its territorial claims in the South China Sea? Yes or no, Pat? Good luck. <laughs> uh, yes, then they'll go back to what they were doing. Bon chance. Uh, yes, they will if China, uh, well, if Hague agrees with China. <laughs> the answer is no. China will attack the tribunal's leg legitimacy and ignore its ruling in a flagrant violation of international law. Bye bye. <laughs>